Hello there. Welcome back to the booth here at Pro Tour Ixalan. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. That's Louis Scott Vargas. This is Paul Chion, and it is our job to guide you through the finals. They are upon us. We've got Seth Manfield and Pascal Maynard sitting in the feature match area, all ready to go. Let's head on down. Hello and welcome back to coverage of Pro Tour Ixalan. We're in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Paul Chion and Luis Scott Vargas. And it is time for the finals, gentlemen. We've got in our feature match area, Pascal Maynard. He comes from Canada. He plays for Team Mass Drop West. And he is on Blue White God Pharaoh's Gift in his second ever Pro Tour Top 8. Across from him, Seth Manfield from Team Genesis. He's playing Sultai Energy, and this is Seth's fourth Pro Tour Top 8. Very impressive resume with, of course, that World Championship victory as well. He's on Sultai Energy. Uh, can you guys run us down how these decks work? We'll start with you, Luisa, the Sultai deck. So Seth's playing an energy deck, so he is trying to generate energy to fuel Long Tusk Cub mainly. And he's got sources like a Tune with Ether and Rogue Refiner. Glint Sleeve Siphoner is his card draw engine, and then Winding Constrictor is really where he gets a lot of edge because it stacks very nicely with Long Tusk Cub and Walking Ballista. Okay. Uh, on the other side of the table is Pascal Maynard playing yeah. Blue White God Pharaoh's Gift. Paul, what is this deck all about? So what Pascal is looking to do is just fill up his graveyard as quickly as possible. And one of the most important cards that he wants to put in his graveyard is God Pharaoh's Gift. The sooner he puts God Pharaoh's Gift into the graveyard, the sooner he can cast the card Refurbish, which is a four mana sorcery that allows him to reanimate uh, an artifact from the graveyard to the battlefield. With the God Pharaoh's Gift in play early, he can start to take over the game with all the other creatures that he's put into his graveyard. Okay, so we've seen early plays from both players here, Luis. Uh, you see that critical whining constrictor on the battlefield already for Manfield, while Pascal Maynard has added a search for Ascanta on his side after playing Opt. Search for Ascanta is really good for Pascal for multiple reasons. One is that it actually lets him put the card in the graveyard. So if he sees Angel Invention or God Pharaoh's Gift, he can dump it. But also, he just fills up his graveyard so quickly it flips into Ascanta, the Sunken Ruin. And we see Pascal main phase opting for land here. He, he wanted to hit land drops, and search for Ascanta really helps him do that. Yeah. Uh, I've seen Pascal just multiple times throughout the course of the tournament just actually hard cast God Pharaoh's Gift. And search for Ascanta just acts as another mana, so another mana source in the late game. What? Sacred Cat jumped in front of the uh, Winding Constrictor right. there. Free energy. And, uh, well, ended up in the graveyard as it often does. Simon Gerton, Simon Gerton's favorite card, apparently. <laughs> Looking to see if it's going to win the Pro Tour. It's very close. We are, of course, playing a best of five here. So the first person to get the three ma game wins in this match will be your Pro Tour Ixalan champion. We're going to play two games of pre-sideboard, and then after that, the players can bring in cards as they see fit out of their sideboard. And there is a Glint Five Sleeve energy. Siphoner, yeah. which is going to get two energy for Seth Manfield. Sure. And he's going to pass the turn back. So this, this is exactly the type of start that Seth Manfield was looking for. Turn two, Winding Constrictor. As the deck basically revolves around this card, if you get to untap and if you get to just kind of take advantage of the benefits of the Winding Constrictor, it can snowball the game out of control. Pascal decided to keep that Glacial Fortress on top of his library with Search for his Kanta. He hasn't actually played it yet, but he wanted to play this Champion of Wits first. And that's going to enable him to discard a uh, God Pharaoh's Gift, and he already has the refurbish in hand, so pretty much everything is, is running the way Pascal drew it up. Yeah, this is an excellent start for Pascal. Now he's probably just going to use this Champion of Wits to get in the way of the Winding Constrictor if th Seth chooses to attack. And he's even giving himself an additional chump blocker here because now by embalming the Sacred Cat, he does have the option to double block the Glint Sleeve Siphoner as it has Menace. So Seth can potentially try to strand Pascal with no creatures in the graveyard by not attacking, but that first of all means that Seth is really not making much headway. And second, Pascal's got Search for Ascanta, so if his top card happens to be a creature, he can just dump something there. That's all under the assumption that, that Seth assumes that there's a refurbish as well? Which isn't a given, but I think it's fairly likely. You, you, you're going to try to 
play your game plan so you can beat that because that is Pascal's main game plan. He's right. seen a lot of extra cards this turn, uh, this game right. between right. Ops, Search, the Champion of Wits draws. Yeah. So one really interesting thing here is Seth is holding Vraska's Contempt in hand. What he can actually do here is cast Vraska's Contempt on the Champion of Wits, then attack with both creatures. Seth can't even block the Glenceave Siphoner, and there are no creatures in the graveyard. Even if Pascal chooses to refurbish that God Pharaoh's Gift, there will be zero targets in play. And Seth certainly giving that a thought, because it, w it would kind of take all of his mana, and where he's got multiple copies of Walking Ballista, which could also clear the path here. Though I think Pascal's going to be happier with this. I think I think this line of play is what Pascal would hope would happen compared to Vraska's Contempt. So Seth is going to go for two separate copies here. Wow. Each of them getting an additional counter, so a total of four to throw around. One of them is going to take out one blocker. The other one's going to take out the other blocker. You see Pascal already making that motion, and there's that attack for four damage, and of course an additional couple of energy as well from the Glint Sleeve Siphoner. So the pressure's on for Pascal Maynard, but he does have Refurbish in his hand. He just needs to find some more action. We know he has a Champion of Wits now in his graveyard, which is, that, that certainly counts. Yeah, this is a big turn now. Pascal gets to refurbish the Godfarer's Gift into play, then put the Champion of Wits in play, allowing him to draw four and kind of further dig for more threats in his graveyard. Seth Manfield doesn't really have a way to interact with the Godfarer's Gift once it's on the battlefield and also just has no graveyard hate in the main. He does actually have Hostage Taker. Uh, he, has, mm. he has a few copies of that, but I don't think I saw any copies in his hand. Yeah. Draw four. Yeah. So Seth's plan here is to let Pascal do all this, but then use the Vraska's Contempt to clear out the blocker, attack for six points of damage, and force through, you know, maybe try to race this in this situation. But the, the problem with that is Pascal's deck is so good at stalling the board. And... Pascal just draws four and discards two, so if he finds any amount of creatures here, he can really present a lot of blockers. Yeah, if he can find an angel of invention here, that would be huge. Let's see if he does. His game plan going quite nicely off of that refurbish. God Pharaoh's Gift about three turns earlier than you'd expect to see it on the battlefield. The next best oh. thing, Sacred Cat. Sacred Cat is <laughs> a lot <laughs> like Angel of Invention. It's still formidable. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it certainly makes racing difficult. Although it looks like Pascal feels like he needs to just go ahead and run that out right now. He's just going to do it the old-fashioned way. That's an embalmed sacred cat. So it actually is a, the much smaller version just as a 1-1. One, one. Yeah. yeah, That's really interesting. He must have more ways to kind of look through his deck, put creatures in his graveyard from his hand. That would be my guess. Yeah, he has a strategic planning, and he knows he's going to hit uh, an additional card off of Search for his counter. That makes a little bit more sense. I think it's just very, very likely for him to find a creature with that strategic that? planning. Sorry. You're at 18, I'm at 17. You're at 17? You attacked for four, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. 18, 17, yeah. yeah. Okay. You, you'll sometimes hear Seth ask for life total confirmations throughout the course of a game. You will. His, uh, his handwriting is not spectacular. Let's just put it that way. I've, uh, I've stood, stood behind him and had to do the life totals and... Uh, <laughs> well, I can't speak either, to be honest. Mine isn't spectacular, but uh, yeah, Seth takes it to a new level. And he does seem to have it sorted out, though, 18 to 17. Seth could also save the Vraska's Contempt here, because he could do something like, use one of my ballistas to take out your Sacred Cat, attack with everything, or attack with the Siphoner and the, the Constrictor. What is it? It's three. three. When, it's, when it's GPG, it's the, it doesn't change, but it's Embalm at zero. They're talking about the tokens that are created by embalming or eternalizing versus, as he called it, GPG. That's God Pharaoh's gift. It does actually change it a little bit. This is a copy. The token there is a copy of the uh, the Champion of Wits, meaning that it does have a converted mana cost of three, where when you embalm it, it actually just becomes, or in this case, eternalize it, just a token that has a converted mana cost of zero. And this was really good for Seth, being able to draw and use Fatal Push, because now he can... Uh, attack for five, put Pascal to 12, and then keep up Vraska's to Contempt to protect from getting hit from a big lifelink. So Seth Manfield continues to uh, to be the aggressor here. 
but yeah. Pascal with his combo set up just needs to find more action in his graveyard right. to make this work. And we could see that advantage bar slam right back in yeah. Pascal Maynard's direction if he can do so. Yeah. Seth currently has the first answer to the first embalmed creature. Even if Pascal Maynard casts a strategic planning and hits a creature, he does have the Vraska's Contempt open. But if Pascal, for example, finds two creatures off the strategic planning, he might have enough time to actually stabilize. Ooh. Angel of Invention would be a big, big find. What he did do is he hit a champion of wits off of the search for his Kanta, and that was also the seventh card. He's deciding if he wants to transform it. Yeah, it, it, he may well not, because the ability to look at your top card each upkeep is actually more powerful than the extra land here, because Pascal's turn here is likely going to be strategic planning plus cast out. You were right. He did not transform it. He's got a pair of cast outs in his hand and an Ipnu Rivulet as well. So Pascal really wants to hit Angel of Invention because that's what's going to give him the, the most chance of stabilizing because if he can hit another champion here, which he has in his graveyard, if he has the time to, to use God Pharaoh's Gift on it, then, oh, and there's the Angel. There oh, it is. He hit it. it is. Then he's, gonna, he's going to win this game off of the repeated draw force. This is, of course, all happening combat. in Pascal's first main phase. And the reason he's saying combat is because he wants to get a trigger off of God Pharaoh's Gift. And, boy, he hit exactly uh, what, the, what you ordered yeah, up for him, cards. didn't he, Luis? He got that... Angel of Invention. And uh, and Seth Manfield is currently holding up that four mana. Pascal does have to be mindful of the fact that Seth could be holding Vraska's Contempt. So because of that, I think he might just actually choose to make servo tokens here because he's still getting a good four mana, uh, a 4-4 four, four flying lifelink token here out of the deal. Yeah, if he gets that hit for four points of lifelink, then he is more than happy with the exchange. And if it gets contempted, at least he's got the two servos back to, to provide some chump blockers. Yeah, that's exactly what he did. Pascal, perfectly aware of the two deck lists here. There are two Vraska's Contempts in Seth Manfield's list, and there's one of them right now. Um, wait, actually, wait. What is he considering? A cast out? What is he might on? cast out, but it doesn't matter whether he does it in response. He's just thinking of whether he wants to. Because he, okay. if he wants to use Cast Out, which I believe he does this turn, he's going to want to use it now while Seth can't cast Blossom of Defense. It would be very devastating to, to get hit by Blossom of Defense on your four mana removal spells. So I think taking out the Glint Sleeve Siphoner or the Winding Constrictor both look pretty appealing here. I think I would probably lean towards the Winding Constrictor just because there's so much that the deck can do with the Winding Constrictor in play. Once the Winding Constrictor is off the table, the Walking Ballista it really isn't all that threatening. Right. Also interesting to note here is that Pascal does have a block currently for the Glint Sleeve Siphoner uh, hanging onto those two Servo tokens. The, uh, the Walking Ballista, of course, has the ability to break that little party up, yeah, but uh, it's a lot of mana to do so. And at this point, Seth's really just looking for a Hostage Taker in order to get Godfrey's Gift off the table. But the, there is a world where Seth actually starts casting it himself. <laughs> right. Seth is looking for Hostage Taker, but Pascal has the second copy of Cast Out in his hand. So if Seth does play the Hostage Taker, Pascal has the answer to that as well. So I think Pascal is just going to firmly take a, uh, you know, get further and further ahead here. He, next turn, he has the ability to get that Champion of Wits onto the table, which will draw him four cards and make him discard two cards. That's just more fuel. There's a rogue refiner. Speaking of refueling, whoop. Just kidding. What else does he have in hand? Of well, set just defense? the blossom defense. But what Seth's thinking about here is whether he wants to just pay four mana to the ballista to get that. to get a token off the board right. and then to get attack in with siphoner. But he's offering the trade here. He does have the blossoming defense. He can just use that as a combat trick, not just a hexproof effect. A any creature Pascal decides to double block, he can just use the Blossoming Defense to get rid of both of the servos. And there, the, the lone cast out in Pascal's deck is just about the only thing uh, that Blossoming Defense is good for anyway, so Seth's probably not too worried about that. Yeah. Seth wisely decides to keep his Siphoner. That gives him the opportunity to start drawing extra cards next turn. Six. And there's that Rogue Refiner to put him up to six. And, well, he did it again. <laughs> 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 it does look like a six, but that's actually a nine on the die. We'll get that switch in there. Go. Trigger. Yeah. Pass the turn. This is a trigger once again for search for his Kanta. Graveyard. It's a land hitting the graveyard. Does he want to transform it now? I think with the Ipnu, Ipnu Rivulet, he's a lot more likely to want to transform it here because he's got a way to get more cards in his graveyard and then he can actually start using as Kanta the Sunken Ruin this turn potentially. So 
Pascal, I think it's looking a lot more appealing than it was last turn. I certainly don't think he wanted to transform it last turn. He does still have the option to cast strategic planning and leave up cast out. It's very similar to the last turn. But that extra mana is, pr is a pretty big deal, especially because he is going to get that champion of wits onto the battlefield. So he's going to have a lot of options once he draws four. And now that that Blossom Defense is out of Seth's hand, I think Pascal's firmly ahead because he's got cast out to deal with the the, the hostage, the potential hostage taker, who Seth hasn't even drawn yet. And you were really seeing, honestly, both these decks do exactly what they're designed to do, and Pascal's coming way far ahead. <coughs> That's generally the case in this matchup as well, right? If Pascal gets to do the things that he wants to do, they're going to be more powerful than what Seth does. Yeah, I think the Seth's best course to just trying to run away with the game is with kind of an early winding constri constrictor slash rish car start, getting a ton of power on the battlefield, or something like a, a long tusk cub as well. Okay. Glint Sleep Siphoner is actually not really the card that he's looking for because you don't really want to go to the late game with a deck like uh, White Blue God Pharaoh's Gift. There it is, Champion of Wits for Pascal Minard. He's going to draw two lands here. Gets to discard two cards from his hand. Getting maximum value off these sacred cats. <laughs> no myself. Okay. No myself. He's still looking for an angel of invention. Oh, there it is. There it is. Now he's got all of his options. He has the champion of wits, the angel of invention, or a sacred cat, I suppose. But of course, he wanted to hit that angel. He did hit it, and now it's come back. It is a four-four. Flying, yeah. lifelink, vigilance, 15 haste. 15 off. That makes two servos. <laughs> that makes two <laughs> servos. <laughs> and even gives the rest of your team plus and plus one. Does it all. For those of you that have been playing for a while, that will remind you of a chroma. Somehow. <laughs> Here in the modern age. A chroma slash Baneslayer Angel slash. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, I've seen Pascal just cast Angel of Invention multiple times over the course of the Pro Tour. It's looked very impressive in that, and even better here, of course, as it's coming as a 4-4 rather than just a 2-1, and you still get all the other benefits. Yeah, at this point, it's really hard for me to even try to come up with a combination of cards that would get Seth out of this. I think it probably starts with drawing a Hostage Taker as soon as possible. Yeah, unfortunately for Seth, Rishkar and three lands look like a, what he's got access to here. And Ooh. that is not going to get him out of this mess. Seth is sitting here trying to find any possible line that could lead him to victory, but it does not look like there's one available to him at this point. Pascal has simply gone over the top of this Whining Constrictor build. that Rish card we mentioned a moment ago. So let's see. Can he actually double pump the Ballista? If he puts a counter on the Rogue Refiner and the Glint Siphoner, no, that he, he can still tap the Walking Ballista for mana as well because it has a counter on it, but that's only seven mana. Right. So he's going to continue to apply pressure in any way that he can, attacking with a Rogue Refiner. That was a recipient of one of those counters. Maynard is at 15 life. He has the luxury of being ahead on board and on life total, so he can take the hit if he really wants to maintain his board or just trade off chump blocker, even go for some type of multi-block if he'd like. Pascal can just put the, uh, the champion of wits in front of the rogue refiner. The rogue refiner is currently a 4-3, and the champion is a 3-2 with that angel on the battlefield. I wonder if Pascal is concerned about Seth may be having a way to get that angel off the board, but it would probably have yeah. to be a Vraska's Contempt here because the Walking Ballista can only deal three damage maximum, and the angel has been eternalized, so it is a 4-4. Four, four. Pascal already has one Champion of Wits in his graveyard, though. I'm sure he'll take another one. And it looks like he's going to get another one. So many cards. Angel's a 4-4 four, four right now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no good. Maybe news not a three three. No good news for you there, <laughs> Seth. Okay. 
so they're just going to trade off. But again, each one of these transaction transactions really benefiting Pascal. You'll see next turn when he brings back one of those uh, champion of wits. He's actually going to draw five cards off <laughs> and, and then discard two. And he I think that was an angel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, make it six Maybe cards. Six, yeah. 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 <laughs> and then All right. Discard two. This one completely out of control. We mentioned this in the semifinal round, but uh, you know, if you like winning. This is a good deck. If you like winning more, this is a yep. really good deck because it <laughs> yep, piles it, it yep. on in the late part of the game. It gets completely out of hand. And you can see, even with a reasonable draw from Seth, I mean, he had a decent start. He got a chance to deploy some of the things that he wanted to do with yeah. the Whining Constrictor and okay. such, sure. and he is just simply outclassed at this point. Watch this. <laughs> okay. And because... He cast that Angel of Invention <laughs> before the Champion of Wits came into play. Right. This Champion of Wits has six power. He gets to draw six cards. It's just insane. Oh, oh yeah. Best I was going to see all the Angels of Invention this Right. Game. You know, and I was going to say, hey, look, another one. But it's like, of course he found Still another one. Still had all these Angels. He gets to uh, see most of his deck, as it turns out. And uh, the real key here is just uh, how much longer is it going to take for Pascal to close the door on this one? as he's getting in for a mighty attack here. That is a 4-4 Angel base. It's getting pumped up. 3-3 three, three servos. You see the rest of it. And game one goes to Pascal Maynard. He said, you know, he had a hard time getting past the quarterfinals and his GP finishes. Luis actually is the one who beat him in his other Pro Tour Top 8 in the quarters. Well, he feels like he's broken the curse and he is now up a game in the finals. Here at Pro Tour Ixalan, we've got a lot more magic for you right after these messages. Test your skill against your local store community and become store champion this December 25th through 31st. Everyone who plays gets a premium full art rare with top finishers receiving a deck box featuring rivals of Ixalan art. If you win the whole event, you'll get the title of store champion and an exclusive store champion playmat to commemorate the victory. Find a store championship near you at magic.wizards.com slash store champs. The game I fell in love with, I want people to experience in many different possible ways. And one of the things that I, I want to see is it expressed itself in, in a, a modern sensibility, in the way that people are playing now. And that part of that is going digital. Like, I love tabletop and we'll continue to make a tabletop game, but we really want to bring out the best experience, the magic experience, the, the electrifying thing that made me fall in love with the game. We want to have people play that in a digital form.
Welcome back to the feature match area here at Pro Tour Ixalan. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. I'm in the booth with Paul Chion and Luis Scott Vargas. It is our pleasure to bring you coverage of the finals where we've got Pascal Maynard from Team Mastrop West. Now, I, I should give you an update here. As far as the teams go, remember, this is the, uh, the first Pro Tour for the full-on team series. And uh, the number one team actually coming into the top eight, Luis, you'll know this, uh, Team Channel Fireball, the team that you play for. Though, if uh, Seth Manfield wins this tournament, they will actually <laughs> pull one point ahead of you. Team Genesis will. Well. A lot on the line for you here, Luis. <laughs> As a member of coverage, I'm not actively rooting for either player. But you literally said you were actively rooting for Siggy at the beginning of the day. As a member of coverage. <laughs> <laughs> wow, got him. Calling him out. You know, it's hard to get Luis speechless, but I think you uh, you get a speechless point there, Paul. Well done. Uh, other side of the table, by the way, Seth, uh, excuse me, Pascal Maynard, Team Mastrop West, if he is to win, if you were to win this, he would... Uh, put Team Mastrop West tied for fourth place with Team Ultimate Guard. So right there near the top of the standings as well. Looks like Pascal on a mulligan to six here. Let's see if he's got a keeper. Well, I'll mention once again, the team competition is a fantastic addition to the Pro Tour. And, uh, you know, it, it has made the Pro Tour both much more exciting and, uh, you know, given you an additional set of storylines to root for. Paul, if anybody had chosen you to be on a team, do you think you would agree or disagree with that? Uh, I think I think that's a true statement. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard for Paul to deal with uh, far-fetched hypotheticals. Oh my! Whining goodness. constrictor on turn two. From wow! Manfield. <laughs> it's getting a little warm in the booth mm. here. Uh, mm. Ideal start for Seth? Maybe not. Right? I, isn't it n better if he leads with a, a long tusk cub and then plays the constrictor after? Yeah. If Seth had a long toss cup in hand, he would play that first. Okay, but still, a good start from him. The Constrictor, of course, a key piece of the puzzle. Pascal Maynard immediately chump blocking to save two life. <laughs> you did good, Ca Sacred Cat. You well, did good. Can I say, in the two matches we've seen uh, from Pascal Maynard, Sacred Cat has the, what, the defender version of must attack. <laughs> <laughs> it has blocked every single time that it has been a, a possibility. I don't think a Sacred Cat has ever chosen not to block. So Seth with a reasonable curve here. R Rogue Refiner, not... At its best in this matchup, I don't think, because it does kind of help you get to that late game. But in the late game, I think the Godfrey's gift deck is a bit favored. But, you know, you get a little bit of that synergy with that uh, with that energy. But Pascal, with the turn three champion of wits, does he have a Godfrey's gift? He does not. No, he does have one key piece of the puzzle, the Angel of Invention. But he's going to need to find a Godfrey's gift pronto to make this work. Let's take a look at his hand here. Well, Minister of Inquiries, champion of wits. He does have the refurbish, though, here, gentlemen. So he does have the other piece of the puzzle. It's simply the Godfrey's gift that he's missing. Yeah, but Seth is now off to a really quick start because I think he has a walking ballista in hand as well. Uh-oh. Wow. This is oh, huge. He does. Look at this. It's going to get three counters. One of them immediately used to kill. And we were just discussing what does a win look like for Seth Manfield. This is what he needs. <laughs> this, this, this game is almost over on turn four. If if Pascal was able to get a to God, Godfrey's gift out this turn, maybe he'd have a shot. But unfortunately for him, he just does not have a gift for this game. And also, these sacred cats just aren't going to be good enough. Most of the time, as, as you've seen, Pascal has been able to chump block with these sacred cats and even the champion of wits. But there's a two-two walking ballista, and if he puts a counter in it, it's going to become a five-five ballista, and it's going to be able to shoot down all of these one toughness creatures. I can't imagine any way for Pascal to come back at this point. He just had to cast strategic planning, leaving him with maximum of two mana for this turn. The best he can come up with is Minister of Inquiries, okay. which is certainly not long for this world, and a massive attack incoming here from Seth Manfield. You can see their Sacred Cat back at it again. That poor thing has been jumping in front of creatures all day. And there we go, as you predicted, Paul. An additional plus one, plus one counter, but two more, one from each whining constrictor, means that there will be no blockers here if Seth wants it to be that way. So this isn't exactly lethal. I believe this is 15 damage if Pascal takes all of it. As that's <laughs> four, seven, 11, plus the four, uh, four, uh, four damage from the counter. That yeah, is 15 no, damage total. I think he's probably still going to have to jump block here but he could potentially take all of it. 
in comes the team from Seth Manfield. And Pascal Pascal's in one of those positions where he's like, well, I need this to try to find the other part of my combo, but I can't survive. No if I don't block, he's not going <laughs> to block. All right. Uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 11. 12, 13, 14, 15, yeah, as you said. And here, even if Pascal finds a God Pharaoh's gift and puts that Angel of Invention in play, that's going to be six life that Pascal gains. However, Seth Manfield does have a Varaska's Contempt and Hostage Taker in hand to get rid of that Angel. Oh, wow. So even so, Seth is in such a position that even if Pascal, quote, goes off this turn, it won't matter. That is unbelievable. And that's going to do it. Wow. Seth Manfield strikes back a very quick game two win. So our players have now split pre-sideboarded games, one game apiece. And of course, this means that it is time for us to move over into our sideboarded portion of the tournament. Let's take a look at Pascal Maynard's sideboard and see what he has brought to the table. Uh, you can see four Fairgrounds Warden. He's been catching some people off guard with that, though he won't be catching Seth off guard as they've had Deckless and of course their team's testing for them. Uh, since last night. Angel of Sanctions, one Fumigate available. That seems like it would be pretty good. Uh, a couple of counter spells, a Sky Sovereign, a Console, and then that Hostile Desert. What do you guys like? So I think in this specific matchup, I think he, you might want to just overload on all these exile creature effects. You have both the Fairgrounds Warden and the Angel of Sanctions. Both of them are pretty good at actually dodging Fatal Push, although I imagine Seth might board that out. But Seth, even in his cyborg, doesn't have access to a lot of spot removal, so if you just overload them and you just continue to play these cards, that might buy Pascal enough time to actually take over the late game with cards like the God Pharaoh's Gift. Okay, let's take a look at what uh, Seth is working with here. A couple of Nisses, Death Ward Scavenger, we know that can affect the graveyard. Another Scarab God, three Duress, two Negate, and then there's some Die Youngs and Essence Scatter, and an Appetite for the Unnatural, so kind of a wide range of sideboard cards here. What do we like for this matchup? Death Gorge, Scavenger, Appetite, both look very, very good to me, as well as uh, Scarab God is a little slow, but it still can wreak havoc on Pascal's uh, game plan. Negate does look much better than Duress because Pascal sees so many cards that I can imagine Duressing him either missing or hitting just like an opt or strategic planning, and then a few turns later he just finds a refurbish. You just hold Negate for that plan. I still think some number of Duress could be right, but I can't imagine you want to go too deep on having too many spells. And then Nissa's interesting in that she does pressure the opponent, and Pascal has very few ways to deal with her, but she isn't uh, all that fast. So I certainly imagine that the Death Scourge, Scavenger, Scarab God, and Negates come in, as well as Appetite for the Unnatural. Nissa and Duress is something that Seth will have determined through testing whether those are effective enough. Yeah, and I do like the fact that having that second copy of Scarab God does actually give you a late game plan to look forward to. Before, you're just thinking, well, if I get to the late game, I'm probably just dead. Mm -hmm. But now you have the scavengers to get rid of cards in the graveyard and also the Scarab God, meaning you're not just dead if the game goes long. One of the things that, that was brought up uh, for Seth for his uh, last match was Rogue Refiner. And whether to take it out or not, which sounds like sacrilege, right? Uh, that, that is co core to the concept oh, it of is. what this does. Yeah. Um, but it was brought up again, actually, for this matchup. Do you, do you think there's anything to be said for taking Rogue Refiner out of the deck? So Rogue Refiner is a card you can actually consider taking out in really focused linear matchups. Mono Red is one. God Froze Gift is another. These are, these are not mid-range decks. These are not attrition wars. These are really fast decks that are trying to enact a specific game plan, and Rogue Refiner is it just a generic good card. Like, it doesn't do anything particularly special. It's just good value. So, yeah, it is, it is reasonable to take out some Rogue Refiners. And also, the, the, there is a hole in the three-drop slot. If you do take out the Rogue Refiners, you're still replacing them with those three copies of the Death Gorge Scavenger. You know, if you just kept all of them in, you might just be kind of overloaded on threes. Yeah, that's a great point. And uh, we have seen that one of the keys to victory for Seth is that he enacts his game plan quickly. The more time that Pascal has, the worse it gets. And Pascal, his entire list is built to buy him time. That's why you see Sacred Cat in this list. It can sit there, chump block. And by the way, we've seen Pascal chump block just two damage. Two regular damage, no energy, nothing. Just soak up two damage with it. He is 
all about putting out those speed bumps and buying himself the time because he knows that as long as his life total is high enough, once he starts getting back angels of invention, he can make up basically any ground that he's lost in the intermediate. Although those sacred cats don't actually look all that strong, given that now he, Pascal's playing against a deck with walking ballista, so you can't really rely on them as good blockers anyways. And he does have a lot of great creatures to sideboard in. I actually think this plan of bringing in four Fairgrounds Warden and Angel of Sanctions is going to be really strong here because Seth doesn't play cards like a braid. He's not playing red. There's no Harness Lightning. There's no braid to get rid of those creatures. Yeah, if you want to use a Vraska's Contempt on my uh, Fairgrounds Warden, well, have at you. You know, that they, they, they don't have that many of those available. And you know, then they might end up losing to the Angels of Invention later. Take a look at our trophy here down in the feature match area. There's only two players left in the tournament. And there's only three games at maximum as the players have split the pre-sideboarded games and are now consulting those sideboards. Lots of tension down in the feature match area as well. I spent a good amount of the quarterfinals down there and uh, you can sense it, you know. Um, yeah, definitely. And But these two players uh, are, are former teammates. They are friends. They used to actually test together, so they're very familiar with how each other plays. No, well, well you said they're former teammates, so they used to be friends. Well, <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> because everything is about the teams, of course. I don't think you understand how the team series works. <laughs> oh, oh, right, right. Yeah, it's different now, Paul. <laughs> you have exactly five friends in the tournament. Pa that is Paul all. Paul and I were former teammates, too. Oh, jeez. Wow. wow. I'm not playing in the tournament, Luis. <laughs> well, that's not surprising either. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I even say words? I just oh, Paul. Uh, <laughs> all right. Paul's you guys need to finish sideboarding soon. This is brutal. <laughs> this is getting brutal. <clears throat> oh, man. All right. It looks like they have, in fact, finished sideboarding just as a potential mercy to poor Paul Chihon here and uh, getting that shuffle going on here. One of the things we're going to notice, by the way, this is our first like sideboarded game, so th the players you know, took a while to sideboard, but based on who's on the player, who's on the draw, these players could vary their plans. Maybe not as dramatically as, say, like the energy mirror, where cards do fluctuate wildly in value, but th there is some play to this player draw, and uh, it's one of the kind of things that I think a lot of people don't realize is whether you're going first or second can and should impact how you sideboard. A lot of people just have a sideboard plan and that's it. Yeah, I think w even when you just kind of go on the internet and just read a bunch of different articles about how you're supposed to play deck and you see sideboard strategies, oftentimes you just see sideboard plan, deck, in, out. Well, that's not exactly accurate. You should actually have a sideboard plan for when you're on the play and when you're on the draw. I think um, I was actually sitting next to Pascal when him and some teammates were actually kind of playing this matchup or, or kind of testing sideboarded games. And he was talking about how like how on the play he likes to keep an op, for example, and on the draw he doesn't. Just like little yeah. things like that. It's exactly the kind of card that you do you have time for on the play, you don't really have time for on the draw. Yeah, exactly. Got my little birdies down there in the feature match area saying some number of rogue refiners hit the sideboard here. You do have to watch out because if you take out too many rogue refiners, and this is true of any energy deck, that your deck actually starts to work a little less well because the deck is built like its land count, for example. You know, it, its energy sources are built with the assumption that you're going to draw a rogue refiner a lot of the games and, and get a little bit of card flow going. Although there aren't quite as many energy sinks in this deck. You know, you don't have the Bristling Hydras and you don't have the Whirler Virtuoso. So the, the energy provided from the rogue refiner isn't quite as important for, uh, for this deck as it would be for the, uh, the Teamer energy The Teamer deck. version, sure. One last consultation of the sideboard yeah. here for Manfield, and we are ready to go. Let's get shuffling, see if we have opening hands. Yeah, th this is just super interesting. I'm excited to see what exactly the plans for both players are after sideboard. There's just so many different things you can do here. Although I will say this, Pascal is definitely bringing in that hostile desert. I think I've seen him sideboard that card in 100% of his matchups. It's done well too. Just seems like his curve always goes up after sideboard because he boards in a bunch of powerful cards and right. he just wants the extra land. I've even seen him bring it in against the in Raminap Red. It's actually very good against that deck, as the, uh, it cannot get stunned by either Earthshaker Kenra or Oncrop Crasher. So if you just pass with two mana up with the uh, the Hostile Desert, you can actually just block all the creatures. Plus, if you can't beat the deserts, you have to join the deserts. <laughs>
So what is Seth definitely taking out here? I would imagine that Fatal Push just has to has to be hit, the, hit the wayside. Uh, Blossom Defense is another card which doesn't really appeal to me. Even if you know Pascal's boarding in cards like Fairgrounds Warden and Angel Sanction, it's just not a favorable exchange. Right, and it's really hard to just keep that mana up all, at all times. And it's not even all that impressive when you Blossoming Defense and Angel of Sanctions. They still have a 3-4 on the battlefield. Exactly. Right. Looks like Seth did board in that Nyssa. But unfortunately not enough lands. <laughs> right. I don't think I saw a tune either. Pascal kept his hand. Oh, no, he does have an attune. Never mind. So Seth is, is looking at a two-land hand on the draw here, essentially. With a bunch of powerful threes, but no two drops. Mm. And Seth does need to get out, get going early to actually uh, kind of be favored in this matchup. Yeah, and, and you know what? He's going to decide that this one just doesn't have the speed needed. He knows if he stumbles or if his game plan takes too long to come together that uh, he could already be too far behind. So he's going to send that one back and mulligan to six. Well, yep. one of the things about this standard format is a lot of matchups don't have aren't attrition-based. Even the team or Mirak is often not attrition-based. And, you know, when you're playing against Ramana, Bread, God, Pharaoh's Gift, Vehicles, you're going to end the game with cards in your hand because you're probably not going to play every single card you draw. That really leans you towards mulliganing aggressively because it doesn't matter whether you have six or seven, what matters is whether you have a turn two play and a turn three play. So I, I think that Seth had made a good mulligan there. He had no two drop. He didn't have a third land. There's so many ways that hand goes wrong. Absolutely. Seth will be on the draw here for game number three. Yeah, I think basically Seth is just committing to mulliganing any hand that doesn't have a two drop, basically. Yeah, he would need a, a highly disruptive hand. And uh, once you get to six cards, of course, your, your standards do loosen. Okay, I'll keep. All right, he's got to keep. Taking a look at that scry. At least he gets to take advantage of uh, being on the draw with the scry and the attune. At least if he scryed to, uh, at least if he scryed to the top. Finds the land off the top of the library. Mm, if you look at Pascal's hand, he did not have the luxury of playing turn one Minister of Inquiries because he's got kept a one lander with double <laughs> opt, and he would really Ooh. like to hit his land on turn two for search for Ascanta. I think I keep this. Oh, for sure. It's, it, it, it is a good hand. It just. Ooh. Well, it's about to Ooh. get a little worse. Will he take one of the ops? That is aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a refurbish and a search for Ascanta in there as a. Well, I, th I think terms. that uh, Pascal's not the only person looking for Ascanta. I, I think that Seth is going to take the search here. Just because if Pascal does opt into a land, a turn two search for Escanta is a really powerful play. He could take the refurbish if he feels it's better to fight against the combo that way, but search for Escanta on turn two is such a powerful play that it would be hard-pressed not to want to take it. Yeah, Escanta seems like the card here. Yeah, for sure. There's a But you know there are people who want to take that off. That's uh, there's, always the, there's always the group of people that just want somebody to just get mana screwed here. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> opt, scry, bottom, draw, opt, damn. <laughs> <laughs> And he did, in fact, take the search for Ascanta. So we're going to see opt on end step here from Minard. Looking for lands. Bottom, did not a find land. One. Oh, not, not a land. land. Draws a card, draws a card for the turn. Not a <laughs> land. Fairgrounds <laughs> Warden off the top. I would have taken the opt. And this is main phase <laughs> off, your last chance. It's going to oh, the bottom. Oh, is he going to miss in five cards? Nope. No, he okay. found an empty rivulet. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Last option here for Pascal Minard. Of course, Seth's going to know what's going on when he sees this, but it was an untapped blue source. So that worked out well for Pascal, as he does at least get to play Minister of Inquiries here on turn number one. Pascal, Pascal still needs a few more lands to get going here. He has all white cards in hand and no more um, hand selection. And his cards aren't even that cheap or that effective right now. <laughs> I think Pascal's in a lot of trouble. A white source. I guess he, 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 he will accept an island because he does have two Minister of Inquiries activations. If he hits a God Pharaoh's Gift and then finds a white source, he can play that refurbish yeah. on Dr turn four. Drawing that island was critical for Pascal because now he's got uh, a lot of ways to, to get something going. Seth Manfield only cycled the land there, and now he's playing a tune with Ether. So even though Pascal hasn't had a particularly Fantastic start, barely making his land drops. 
Seth Manfield hasn't really done that much either. He played a Duress, and this is the second spell he's played this game with Tune with Ether. No creatures on the battlefield, no pressure whatsoever. Pascal also has to be feeling much better about Minister of Inquiries after sideboard because I think he just kind of assumes Seth is going to board out those fatal pushes. So you're just, it's, it's basically a, a one mana card that's almost assuredly going to get you six cards in your graveyard. And then chump block at some point. Yeah. Does everything. Yeah, does it all. Honestly, <laughs> it's funny, but that's exactly what Pascal's deck does in a big picture. It chump blocks and gets cards in the graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a plan. Yep. Okay, land, and we already got a Siphoner. Yes, Glint Sleeve Siphoner here for Seth Manfield. We did just get sideboarding notes from our floor reporter, Tim Willoughby, if you guys uh, yeah. okay. want to take a gander at those. Ooh, so Pascal drew the planes. Wow. He's got oh. one more mill. If he hits here the God Pharaoh's, God gift, Pharaoh's gift, it could almost end the game right here. Let's see if he hits. One, two, three. Not quite. But he does have the backup plan of, of uh, using a Fairgrounds Warden on Glint Sleeve Siphoner. Oof, that those cleans those mana huge. draws were nice. For if he draws Pascal. another white source, he can just start casting those angels in his hand. Yes. And even if he doesn't, he could maybe sack the Ipnu Rivulet and then it have additional outs to try to hit God's Pharaoh's Gift. Oh, man. <laughs> we went from one last card to look at to make your second land drop, Pascal, to him going land into the other color of mana for his deck. And he's just he, cast spells on the last He few went points. opt, miss. Draw, miss, opt, finally drew the land, then drew island, then drew planes. He did not miss a land drop after keeping a one lander. <laughs> and he bottomed with that first uh, Right. <laughs> he saw a lot of extra cards, he though. Did. He did. Okay, what do we got for four mana here for Manfield? Looks like a hostage taker. Ooh, man. hostage taker. Uh, this is really strong. If Pascal can't get that Fairgrounds oh, Warden off the board, Seth Manfield can then cast the Fairgrounds Warden to get something else. Okay, finally missed a land drop here for Pascal, though he did find a pretty nice card with Champion of Wits, a way for him to uh, further dig through his library, maybe even find that Guard for <laughs> God for us gift for his graveyard. And if Seth cast that Fairgrounds Warden, it might actually just be a liability because then Pascal can Angel Sanctions the <laughs> Fairgrounds Warden and whatever was off it came, just will come back right back into play. Yep. So Champion was a good draw. So Pascal has been doing well for himself these, these last three or four draw steps. So Pascal is out of energy, so no more activations from yeah. the Minister of Inquiries. And he did, in fact, find a land. It's and it was the right one, too. White source. Yeah. It's actually tough here because Pascal kind of wants access to almost all of the cards he has. He has to discard two of them. He definitely needs to keep the planes. It'd be nice to be able to cast Angel Invention, and he's got expensive Embalm and internalized costs, so he has incentive to keep you know, some of those cards in hand as well. Uh, so taking a look at Pascal's sideboard plan, he actually just sideboarded into kind of a, a more controlling deck and isn't quite all in on the combo. He took out, sorry guys, he took out the four sacred cats. No. Yeah, yeah, he did. He did. Well, we knew that was coming. Right, and then he took out the uh, he took out one God Pharaoh's gift and two copies of Refurbish. So he did trim down on kind of the combo pieces, expecting the um, the graveyard hit. Yeah, and it looks like based on what he's discarded here, he's just going to go fair, as he's kept the two. Angels in his hand, one sanctions, one of invention, and he discarded the refurbish as well as the uh, other champion of wit. So, you know, with a few more land drops, he can eternalize that, and in the meantime, he gets to just go powerful five drop, powerful five drop, and uh, that might be able to power him to the uh, victory here anyway. Yeah, and, and what these five drops do is they each also buy him additional time. And it, it synergizes quite nicely because each angel that buys you additional time lets you use Eternalize on your Champion of Wits or embalm your other Angel of Sanctions. And yeah, Pascal's very capable of winning the game just with these legit cards and not even comboing off. Another Attune with Aether here for Seth Manfield. Yeah, it's weird. There's not even a great target for that Fairgrounds Warden. You don't really want to get. <laughs> you don't even want. You don't even really want to get either of those creatures. Seth somehow in the tank about what to get with a Tune with Ether, though he found a mountain. 
Excuse me, a forest was what he ultimately decided on. It looks like he does have a bit of lands in hand. He's got another tune as well, along with a rogue refiner. I can't hear you. I think he needs you to play faster. What? <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear. Play a little yeah. faster, please, Seth. That's what he's asking. They're going to make sure that he can hear it through the microphone. Yeah, right. For those of you act asking about the headset, we do have that on okay, because okay. we are broadcasting in the building. That's right. Paul, Luis, and I, they can, they can hear us out in the feature match area. And, of course, we don't want the players getting any information about what's going on with their opponent. And there's a rogue refiner now for Seth Manfield. <laughs> that, 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 that nine is tricky. <laughs> Did he do yeah. it again? Mm, <laughs> right, right. That is six. It's a six. Yeah. Oh, the, the little dot. Right, <laughs> yeah, right, the, right. The, that's the key, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. So a rogue refiner, a glint sleeve siphoner, and a hostage taker. No attacks. Where does this go for Seth Manfield? So Seth is drawing two cards a turn off of Glint Sleeve Siphoner. So I think that that is pretty significant. On the other hand, Pascal has three powerful exile effects. Seth's going to be able to counter the first one with Blossoming Defense. but And that's going to buy him essentially two extra cards because he's going to get his draw step plus the, the Glint Sleeve Siphoner. But Pascal's going to be able to do this multiple times in a row. So and first things first, Angel of Sanctions targeting Hostage Taker. And as you predicted, Luis, Blossoming Defense is going to fizzle that. But as you predicted earlier, Paul, he still gets the three four flyer out yeah, this, of the This is still a one for zero, right? It's you play exactly five mana, you got a three four flyer, and you got a blossoming defense out yeah. of Seth Manfield's hand. Yeah. It's like Angel of Sanctions had duress attached to it or something. <laughs> right. And, and if Seth Manfield uses a removal spell to get rid of the Angel of Sanctions, it still comes back with the ball. Oh, this hand's gonna be this turn's gonna be good. Seth hit it looks like a Death Guard scavenger and a duress. Take your, uh, take your life. Yeah, what do you have life totals at? You're at eighteen, I'm at nineteen. Okay. Just a little reminder there for Seth from uh, from Pascal. Because Seth's going to be able to duress the cast out. Death Court Scavenger, one of the, like the, the other Angel of Sanctions in the graveyard. And at some point, potentially even even use Angel of Sanctions. Or uh, Hostage Taker Angel of Sanctions if he wants. Seth does have all the answers at this point. Oh, okay. And he plays a Fairgrounds Ward in here. On the uh, on the Angel of Sanctions, and then probably uses the duress just to make sure Pascal doesn't have an answer. Well, the way Seth has tapped his mana, and the fact that he used the Fairgrounds Warden first, may indicate that he's interested in casting uh, just the, the second Hostage Taker this turn. Does he have the mana for that? Maybe he just plays a Scavenger okay. and gets rid of the uh, the Angel of Sanctions it's in the graveyard. Zero. Well, he, Seth hasn't put a land yet, so he might do right. both. He can play Scavenger and Duress, or he can just... Scavenger to take out the Angel of Sanctions. 20. Yeah. He could have played an Attune with the uh, Aether this turn, right? And played a land? Or did he already play a land this turn? Or maybe he already played a land. Yeah, he, he must have played yeah. a land this turn. Well, Pascal gets to Two cards. use Cast Three Out. Cards. Well, while Seth's tapped out, he can Cast Out the... The Fairgrounds Warden, get back Angel, Angel away the Glint Sea of Siphoner, and kind of stabilize. Or potentially the Death Gorge Scavenger, depending on what he thinks is the bigger threat. He has whittled Pascal's board down to just the one two. I believe that the, the Glint Sea of Siphoner is a slightly bigger threat just because Death Gorge Scavenger has only has two targets now, and you can just block it if it attacks. But the second hostage taker in Seth's hand is going to be critical this game. Yeah. Although Pascal might value those uh, Champion of Wits in Graveyard because that does give him kind of the, the late game inevitability. All Pascal needs to do is find some lands. But yeah, like you said, the Hostage Taker is going to be able to swing this game around. Looks like he's going to go for the cast out here. Pascal not, not choosing to get greedy here. He could nope. chart a course first to try to find a land. <laughs> yes, yes. He's going to just cast cast out. That is going to initiate kind of a cool chain of events here. <laughs> The, hot, the uh, Fairgrounds Warden is going to leave, which is going to bring back the Angel, which is going to get now another trigger. And as we were talking about, the Glint Sleeve Siphoner, perhaps the best option? 
looks like it. Leaving just Death Gourd Scavenger and a 2-3 hostage taker on the battlefield here for Manfield. As he goes to his draw step. Is that another hostage taker? How many is he playing? Three? Yeah. Three. Oh, it's walking ballista, but okay. either way, a good disruptive element. And unfortunately for Pascal, he drew a, he actually drew a spell, so this duress is going to hit. <laughs> oh, no. There's that chart, of course, that we talked about a minute ago being discarded to duress and leaving Angel of Invention behind for Pascal, which we will likely see next turn. The ether for Manfield. Hey, we did it. We got the six on the first try there. Manfield's going to play a swamp. Yeah, now Pascal's in a lot of trouble. Yeah, he needs to land, find right? another cast out I don't think so. or an Angel of Sanctions. I don't think I played a land. Yeah. I don't think he meant to play a land. Last turn, you cast this. And he had I six lands in play last turn. turn. Out. It looks like Pascal is just double checking. That is the most common way for people to figure out, well, what did you cast last turn and how much of your mana did it use up? But as we mentioned, Seth had not played a lad this turn, though he just did play that swamp. What does he have here? It's got to be the hostage taker here, it right? It was, yes, the other hostage taker. And <laughs> once again, another chain of events is going to <laughs> unfold here as the glint sleeve siphoner ends up back over on Manfield side of the battlefield and the angel's gone after the dust is settled and this is going to clear the way for an attack so as you said Paul advantage Manfield right now Pascal needs to find something champion of wits. one of the two champion of wits gets exiled Yeah, Pascal c also can find a Fairgrounds Warden here, I guess. Ooh, refurbish. Does that do anything here? It doesn't. Then that's one of the risks of uh, having a halfway plan where you mm -hmm. aren't fully committed is you draw a card like refurbish and you just have one fewer God Pharaoh's gift in your deck. You have fewer ministers. You It ends up being a, a dead card, which it is right now. Yeah, he actually has two refurbishes left in deck after sideboard, and he drew the second one. Yeah, he had discarded one earlier in the game. But he does still have Angel of Invention at his disposal. Yeah, that does put a lot onto the battlefield, but Seth Manfield's last card in hand is a Walking Ballista, which does a pretty good job of dealing with this Angel of Invention. Especially if Pascal decides to make servos, which is what he's going to do. Oh, this one has firm, has swungly firm in Seth. Swungly, has so firm swung in ball. Seth Manfield's direction. Yeah, yeah and pa by the way, P Seth can also just cast this Angel of Sanctions as well, which he's heavily incentivized to do. Hostage taken. <laughs> and we've seen how powerful this card was in the limited portion earlier in the weekend. Oh, it's Ballista time. Oh, it's Ballista time indeed. That's eight mana. You don't think it's an Ancient Brontodon? <laughs> that wouldn't be bad here, to be honest. <laughs> it actually wouldn't be. Yeah, that's going to clear oh, away a lot of the board. Both, yeah. yeah, this goes to one. Everything can get in. Seth is probably going to eat the other champion of wits. Target a champion. <laughs> Is that three for three on the on the, on the wrong? Three no, it's three for four. Oh, three for four. <laughs> yeah. We we just need uh, we need one judge <laughs> just to do that. But of course, that is not what's relevant here. What's relevant here is the fact that Seth Manfield is piling in a massive attack and putting Pascal down to three life. He finds strategic planning. 
That's not fumigate at all. That is not. So he can f strategic planning and look, uh, hope for a fairgrounds warden to get that hostage taker off the board. Yep. That is what he's looking for here. Well, let's see if he finds one. Nope. He does not see it. He's looking, and I feel like he's going to just scoop him up here. Yeah. Land God Pharaoh's gift would have also done it. That's going to do it. Seth Manfield wins game number three, and he's up two games to one, one step closer to that elusive Pro Tour championship. Man, if he were to win this, he's going to have a world championship victory and a Pro Tour. He'll be a Pro Tour champion. That is tough to do. It'll put him in some rarefied air, and as well, That'll be his, uh, this has been, I should say, his fourth Pro Tour top eight as well. So I know that the discussions around the, the Hall of Fame are going to start, uh, you know, really making a case here for uh, Seth Manfield. Let's take a look at Hostage Taker. Really the difference maker in that game. Um, we've seen Hostage Taker range in value quite a bit here in Standard, but that game, critical. Yeah. Just taking a look here. Yeah, Hostage Taker just gives you an answer to a variety of different threats. There's there's a lot of very sticky threats. L cards like Hazareth the Fervent, the Scarab God. Hostage Taker deals with all of those. Oh, by the way, it also deals with artifacts. You can take vehicles as well. Uh, Why? <laughs> uh, you well, can't take things as hostage. Yeah, but before Luis says That's anything... That's just stealing. Before Luis says anything, no, you cannot blame me for Hostage Taker. I was not involved in making this card. Look, you work at Wizards of the Coast, man. <laughs> right. It's fair game. <laughs> Try to get your flavor game on point for us, Paul, right, all right? Sorry. I mean, cool card and everything, <laughs> but, like, it's just stealing if you take an artifact. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look at an absolutely critical card on the other side of the battlefield as well. This is Angel of Invention from Pascal Maynard. Uh, this is really become the best thing to bring back with God Pharaoh's Gift. It's the, the card that makes this deck worth going for because it gives you a 4-4 four, four lifelink alongside two 2-2s two or a 6-6 six, six lifelink when you use God Pharaoh's Gift. It also is good just to cast. It's a 5-mana threat that your backup plan of just hard casting it, well, it se seems pretty effective most of the time. Maybe not so much against Walking Ballista, <laughs> but in general, it, it's a card that keeps you alive and then can finish the game. It does double duty. Yeah, it's really strange because oftentimes when you play decks like this where you're quote-unquote cheating something into play, you know, like it, those creatures are generally very difficult to cast. They're really expensive cards. But for this, the backup plan of just playing it is just really powerful by itself. Pascal Maynard has just cast this, just hard cast this card multiple times throughout the course of the, throughout the, course of the tournament, and it's just been good enough by itself on rate. I'm not surprised, by the yep. way. You know, I remember when I first saw Angel of Invention, and I thought, wow, that is a lot of power. The flexibility of Fabricate really shown off by this card as well, where you can go wide if you need to stabilize the board, but if you're pretty, uh, pretty sure that the Angel of Invention is not going to die, then, hey, those plus one, plus one counters, you know, those have Flying Vigilance and Lifelink as well and, and can often do better than a, than a pair of uh, creatures down on the ground. Certainly has been the turning point in many a match for Pascal Maynard as well. The turn when he's able to God Pharaoh's gift one of those back has been sort of the death knell for his opponent. That that has often been the turn where you go, yeah, I might have won this game, but I'm not anymore. Right. I wonder if Pascal, you know, that last game might have been a little bit frustrating because he drew those multiple copies of Refurbish. I wonder if he's going to bring that fourth copy of God Pharaoh's gift back into the main deck for uh, for game four. It's possible. I, I do think that his plan of just casting a bunch of Angel of Sanctions is a pretty good one. Hostage Taker does present a problem, but Seth drew a lot of Hostage Takers that game <laughs> and had a key Blossoming Defense, of which he only has two post-board. Yeah, Seth only has those three Hostage Takers. Meanwhile, Pascal is boarding up to seven copies of ways to kind of deal with creatures when it enters the battlefield. So, And he drew. A, he looked at a lot more cards than, uh, than Seth as well, but just couldn't find an answer for those Hostage Takers in time. I think the, 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 a really nice interaction that we saw was just the combination of duress plus hostage taker. Using the duress to get those cast outs out of the way so that the close coast was clear for the hostage takers was a pretty big deal. So this could be the last game here at the Pro Tour. And this is where the, uh, the tension really gets ramped up. I mean, you guys have eight Pro Tour top eights between you, so a lot of experience down <laughs> in the feature oh match area. <laughs> as well. You too. 
<laughs> Come on, Marshall. That, that's just just as factual though. It's not even a beat. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, yeah. it could be factual and also a beat. That's just possible, right? All right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but this is honestly where now the players know, right? Like this is where it's like, wow. If I win a game, it's all come down to you know just a single game of magic. All of a sudden, the pro tour is going to be over. Somebody's going to be handing me a trophy and fifty thousand dollars, and. Uh, you know, it can be life-changing on many levels for these players as far as their career goes as well. Though, from what I've seen, and Luis, you can back me up on this as well, um, <coughs> the players tend to not think in those terms in that moment, right? They, they really don't because God, it doesn't change you your in-game decision-making. Yeah. Well, at least, okay, I can speak for myself. I, I don't really know go what's going through everyone's head. I know that when I'm at the end of a critical game, I'm up 2-1 and the final stretch is in sight, I start thinking about it. Because I'm like, well, I'm going to win this game. You know, I can see it two turns in advance. This is awesome. I'm, like, really excited. Mm -hmm. But while you're playing the game, for the most part, you really shouldn't let that interfere with you. And some people do, and that's that's not good for them. And some people don't care at all. But, you know, every now and then, uh, it, it, does, it does actually matter. I want to ask you a question, Luis. Was that true in Berlin almost 10 years ago? when you won the Pro Tour? Well, he was down 0-2 every time at that Pro Tour. <laughs> but what about in the, in the Except finals? Except the finals. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I, I played against uh, Mate Zadoka in the finals, and my draws were just absurdly good, and I kind of ran him over. And in but, the but Well, th what was interesting, because to, to give a little bit of context, I was playing an Elf combo deck, yeah. and it went off. And once it started going off, it was pretty deterministic. You knew you were going to win. When I was going off in the last game and knew I was going to win, it felt pretty good. Okay. Because, like, I get to keep playing here, but I know I'm going to win. <laughs> That has to be the best case scenario. By the way, <laughs> speaking of the not best case scenario here uh, for Seth Manfield, he's going to Mulligan. Is this to just a just a Mulligan to six? Mm -hmm. Okay. I remember one of the moments that, that was uh, that was Luis's first top eight and his uh, first PT uh, win uh, is you know in w in one of his, in one of his matches in the top eight there were a lot of elf decks in the top eight. He he kind of stared at his hand for a while. Decided, shook his head a little bit, sighed, sighed then kept, and then killed his opponent on turn two on the play. <laughs> he just had it all. <laughs> I was just like, why did you do that? The, the side keep is a classic move, and, you know, <laughs> Pascal could be running it here. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see. Possibly. The classic side keeps. Well, there is something to be said with not putting your, you know, playing with your hand face up. And... Sometimes pretending you have a bad hand when you have a great hand is useful in concealing. Or just show nothing. Yeah, but there's no fun in that. <laughs> oh, okay. See, so the, the truth comes out. Okay, he has kept. Blossom Defense is the kind of card you want to draw like exactly one of a lot of games. One of the things that's underrated, by the way, about Pascal's deck is I like the the mana base. All untapped lands except for the three cycle lands is just awesome. Yeah, only two colors. Yeah, you can't afford to miss a beat with this deck. On turn four, you have to have that land come into play untapped for the refurbish, especially against decks like Raminap Red. Right, of course. So a couple of basic lands in play here for Pascal Maynard. <laughs> oh, has that. To turn back it was to critical. Seth. I was like, wow, that hand doesn't really do a whole lot. But then I saw Champion of Wits. That was the last card. Pascal's like, please play a Winding Constrictor. I just I just want to start unloading these Fairground Wardens. Well, please play a, a Walking Ballista. That would be the dream. Oh, yes, for sure. Well, he didn't get to quite live the dream, but it was a Winding Constrictor, a fine target. He's going to cycle cast out, still trying to hit those lands. Looks like he's got a couple of them in his hand here. Oh, yeah. The time has come. Really hard to resist just slamming Fairground Warden here. Pascal could play champion if he's trying to think of maybe trying to combo off, but the way his deck is built, I would be surprised if he really wants to let a, a Winding Constrictor you know, get it do its thing. Yeah, this is just a big tempo swing. I think you just want to play this out. Yep, and that's exactly what happens. Fairgrounds Warden grabs that uh, Winding Constrictor. And leave Seth Manfield with no non-land permanence on the battlefield, so he's going to have to rebuild now. Seth's hand doesn't have a whole lot. He's got that appetite for the unnatural, but currently no targets. And also, he's got a duress, but I don't think Pascal Minator actually has any spells in hand. Well, this is one of the advantages of boarding the way Pascal did. 
Duress and Aptid of the for the unnatural are sideboard cards Seth brought in, and Pascal has no targets for either of them. <laughs> yeah. He's going to get rid of Cast Out here with the Death for Death Gorge Scavenger. Yeah, I, I like Pascal just running Fairgrounds Warden, Fairgrounds Warden, Angel of Invention, Angel of Invention. Oh, yeah, that that's does seem pretty start. good. <laughs> and he does have uh, an Angel of Invention off the top of the library to add to the one in his hand. He does have another copy of Fairgrounds Warden. He could just do it. I would be pretty tempted to just play another one here. He almost did, but then he's actually thinking, eh, maybe I do just want to play the Champion of Wits. The, of course, downside to doing this is that there is that Death Gorge Scavenger, and it can gobble up a piece of the puzzle here. So I think that he part of the reason to play Champion of Wits is to kind of ensure you hit your fifth land to make sure you play that Angel of Invention on curve. But his hand at the time was so good, it, it would have, you know, play, you do already have a backup Fairgrounds Warden. I think I would have just considered playing the Fairgrounds Warden and just waiting. Well, it turns out Pascal didn't actually draw the land either. Oh, okay. So he, he's not guaranteed to, to, to lay his fifth land here. And not having Fairgrounds Warden to play means his board is a little worse, you know, given that Seth keeps the Death Gore Scavenger around. Oh, he didn't have a fourth land. Does seem to be. Oh, no, does. he did. Why didn't he play his fourth land? Right? I think that was just a straight up misclick. Yeah. Did yeah. he just forget to play a land right Th now? That was he, the, uh, the classic IRL misclick. He, he, yeah, he assuredly did. Yeah. There, there's no strategic relevance to having to keeping the land in hand, and he's got a handful of five drops. What? Wow. What in the world? That the whole point of playing Champion of Wits was to make sure you hit your land drop. What a strange play. And oh, what do you think Seth is going to think when he sees that whip. island? Oh, wait, was it a straight riff? Or no, he gets a Sky Sovereign. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, plays like wow. a creature, but is not. Wow. Huh. What a weird chain of events here. Well, if Pascal doesn't draw a land in his turn, he won't. He at least won't get punished for that. But <laughs> if he had played Fairgrounds Warden, then that duress would have just whiffed. Completely whiffed. Yes. Oh no, he drew the Sky Sovereign on his turn. Actually, never mind. Oh, he, did he? Okay. Yeah, he would have. It would have. It would have still hit. I wonder what's going through Seth Manfield's mind. Um, he may not be thinking about it because he might be a little just focused on his plays. But if he does think about it, he'll probably just be like, "Wow, that was weird." <laughs> <laughs> Also, that was just a good opportunity for Pascal to play the Fairgrounds Warden because, of course, Seth Manfield does have Blossoming Defense in his deck. He might ha Once you let Seth Manfield untap, he might be able to play, uh, for example, a threat and still keep up Blossoming Defense. So, Well, Seth now has to decide between playing his other Death Gorge Scavenger or leaving up defense. He doesn't actually have the mana for both, unfortunately for him. So does he just basically like waste three mana this turn or does he play into the fairgrounds warden which is likely coming down i think he's going to want to just tap out because there's so many fairgrounds wardens he will eventually get to use blossoming defense right well it looks like he's actually gonna it, it looks like he's thinking about passing the turn at the very least <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh, the realization. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. There it was. Pascal oh, did not that, there that is the look of heartbreak <laughs> oh, no. on the face of Pascal Maynard, who can simply shake his head. He didn't recognize it until now, and now he's like, "Wait a second! Why are you ahead on lands?" But Seth has a three-drop in play. It's just very clear. Yeah, and he, of course, has <laughs> Well, he, he has a three-drop in play, and then he played yes. another three-drop, so. And Seth said, I think you missed a land drop, which, of course, we know to be the case. So, Seth actually did just follow up a Death Gorge uh, scavenger with another one there. Is this a land? It's not. It's not a land. Though, it's a chart, of course, which means he would have been able to maybe chart a course and still play Fairgrounds Warden. Right. This is going to be tough because Pascal is still not in a terrible position, but boy, he really needs to get his mental game together because he's going to feel silly, right? He's just going to he's going to be embarrassed by that mistake because it's such a, a base level mistake, you know, not a strategic error. He just forgot. It's that simple. He's been playing Magic for three days straight, and uh, he finds himself in this high pressure environment. But the key here is, can he find a way to win this game from here, even with that error? 
Yeah, I, I still I mean, think I will, you can. <laughs> I will say one of the first on camera matches I ever played, I played turn one, tap land, turn two, thought seize, and just didn't play land on turn two. I just straight up forgot. Mm -hmm. Like, these things certainly happen. They do. And like you said, Pascal just has to get his head in the game. And, you know, he's winning this game. I actually do think he's ahead this game. Those Death Court scavengers sooner are going to be reduced to one because he's going to play a Fairgrounds Warden this turn. And then uh, Pascal's really not going to be under that much pressure and has an Angel of Invention in hand, plus a chart, of course, for the longer game. So. Yeah, he's got two removal effects, an Angel of, of Invention and a draw two in hand. And yeah. Seth's hand is an appetite with no targets because he duress the only target. Right. <laughs> and a Blossom <laughs> Defense, which <laughs> might stop a Fairgrounds Warden trigger, but is really not going to, to end this game. Yeah, so the interesting part about this is that the mistake that he made actually isn't going to punish him super hard. The only way he could get out of hand is if he lets it affect him. And I think that it looks like Pascal has uh, you know, started to dial back in here. And he's going to actually start attacking now. He's going to attack for three damage on top of it. Seth really needs to draw a removal spell. That, that That's what he's looking for. Because if he... Fairgrounds Warden is great, but if Seth can start killing those Fairgrounds Wardens, then it's going to snowball out of control because each one he kills removes a threat from Pascal's side of the board and gives Seth another creature. But Seth's deck just doesn't actually have a lot of removal. It's got two Vraska's Contempts along with three Hostage Takers. And Hostage Taker is not a, a great way to, to remove a creature here because Pascal Maynard does have that third copy of Fairgrounds Warden in hand. Pascal takes four from the uh, scavenger, g drops down to 12, and there's the uh, winding constrictor. So no removal here for Seth Manfield. Land here would be huge. No, it was a refurbish. Has to be one of his worst draws at this point. You can see his graveyard has been uh, properly chewed up there by the Death Gorge scavengers. Well, refurbish gives him something to discard a chart, of course, at the very least. Oh, and hey. he's attacking. Will Seth Manfield choose to block and cast Blossoming Defense here to get his other Winding Constrictor back, or is he just going to let the creatures bounce off of each other? I suspect Seth is more likely to let it bounce just because he knows of about the third Fairgrounds Warden in hand. Right. Pascal just wanted to be able to draw two and not have to discard. So that was a raid attack, for those of you wondering at home. He did find that critical fifth land here, and it's a good one. It's Glacial Fortress. And he found a Minister of Inquiries. So now he does have a card that can potentially help him find um, the God Pharaoh's Gift, and that refurbish might actually be live. So Pascal now has to decide between tapping out for Fairgrounds Warden or playing Minister to enable the refurbish. And it looks like he's chosen for the higher upside play, figuring he's at 12 life. He's got blockers on the battlefield. With that Winding Constrictor, Walking Ballista is now a live draw because he can use he can play a 3-3 Walking Ballista to get one of those Fairground Wardens off the board. Seth also has a glimmer of hope here in uh, using his appetite for the unnatural. Now that he's that minister, he's like, all right, maybe I'll get a chance to, 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 <laughs> to, you know, to, to snipe a God Pharaoh's gift. Right. Appetite does have a few targets. Not only can it get the God Pharaoh's Gift, there are, there are two copies of Search for Ascanta and those cast outs that we've seen earlier in the matches. So it looks like Pascal's going to have to decide whether he wants to play into Blossoming Defense by blocking with a Fairground Warden here, at the very least on the Winding Constrictor. I don't think that Seth can, or Pascal can just let Seth hit him over and over again. At some point, he's going to have to get into combat. <laughs> They've renegotiated the placement of the exiled cards. Right. Yeah, you know, I think he was thinking, well, if you kill one, just tell me which one you want back. But it does matter which one's tapped, which one's in combat, so right. they're going to have to move those back under. Yeah, well, Pascal here, yeah, I don't think he wants to risk losing that Fairgrounds Warden, so I don't think he's going to be blocking there. He could put the Champion of Wits in front of the Death Gorge Scavenger to prevent some damage, but six, at the same right? time, the b the Salt High Energy deck doesn't really have a whole lot of reach, so he can't afford to take some damage, because he does have mm -hmm. that Angel of Invention in hand still. He can just play that next turn. And then at that point, it just locks up combat. Though, <coughs> Pascal should be worried about Walking Ballista. At some point, that card is going to be a, a big threat. Yeah, you're talking about reach, and that, that is the one good form of reach that this Salt High deck has. They can certainly get you dead. 
But the window's going to close quickly on that for Seth Manfield as we do see Angel of Invention hit the battlefield now for Pascal. That's going to bolster up the ground game in a huge way for him. I think I like even attacking with the minister at this point. He could just get in there. <laughs> just get in there for a couple uh, of damage. I, I mean, with the refurbished in hand, he's probably better off right. killing. But Unless he knows exactly that Seth has that appetite in hand. It is kind of interesting, though, because Pascal has a long way to go to make that refurbish good. He needs to mill creatures and a God Pharaoh's gift at this point. Yeah, he can block with the Champion of Wits, so he does have five lands in play. If he plays land number six, and let's say he chump blocks next turn with the Champion of Wits, if he draws land number seven, he can just eternalize. Mm. Pascal not playing around Windstrider here. <laughs> well, no, he has. Oh, it's a two four. Angel of Invention. Yeah, right, right, of course. <laughs> All the angles. Okay, so Pascal with a misstep early in this game, but he has certainly recovered from it and is back on track, even ahead in this game at this point. Ooh. With a dominating board presence. The downside to the Rishkar Pima Renegade that Seth drew is he really doesn't want to give. Pascal, a champion of wits, eternalized, so he has to be worried about about that. Yep. And Pascal is going to get into combat here. He's going to throw some servos around. He's going to try to take things down. So Seth might actually be forced to use blossoming defense in combat here when Pascal double or triple blocks. I think, which I think is likely to happen. And Pascal does know Seth Seth Manfield's deck list. There's really no card that Seth can have right now that would get rid of the Angel of Invention on the board. So as Pascal, as long as he leaves the Angel back, he can make you know pretty good blocks for himself. So the Death Guard Scavenger would have five toughness. So it's currently... A f oh, because it, it would eat uh, strategic planning here? And then that would induce Pascal to maybe block with two tokens and a minister. So yeah, Seth, Seth's not even willing to risk that. And here we go. Let's see if uh, Pascal can find... Ooh, oh, there's, there's a, a Godfrey's God gift. gift. But he doesn't have any creatures yet. But he gets another shot at it with uh, that minister. Uh-oh. This could be the one that puts him over the top and forces game five. Well, Seth can still appetite the God Pharaoh's gift. Yeah, he does have access to two mana up, and of right. course, Rishkar's ability, any creature you control with a counter, does get to tap for green mana, so Seth can use that appetite to get the God Pharaoh's gift before the combat step. Now, Pascal's not aware of that, right? He doesn't know about uh, appetite. Right. So if he does hit a creature, he may just go for it anyway, but it won't end up working out for him. Though this is not one of those games where if Seth thwarts Pascal's plans, then Pascal loses. If Seth appetites the, the God Pharaoh's gift, then Pascal just gets to continue playing his fair game. He's not all in on it. Which he's ahead on, right? Oh, by, by a decent amount. Right. So there, to kick things off, though, is a champion of wits. It does have three power, draw three, discard two. Well, a fairgrounds warden. Though it is kind of interesting, because if he wants to discard one of those creatures, he could find it stuck in the graveyard, thanks to that appetite for the unnatural where he could just cast it and get value. Right. And he didn't even uh, main phase dig to even look for that refurbish. He could have activated the minister main step, main phase, cast, uh, try to hit a creature, then play refurbish on the God Pharaoh's gift to try to get a creature, but he decided not to do that. Discards opt an island and is now looking at a strategic planning in hand. Right, I think it's time to use the blossoming defense here. This one has further slipped away though from Seth Manfield. He was looking to close out the Pro Tour with a win in this game right now. But it's starting to look like Pascal Maynard is having none of it and is gonna force a game Four. number five. Let's see if he can finish this thing off. There's a glint sleeve siphoner for Seth Manfield. And here's that mill. A warden. Wow. And, oh, there is an angel. 
Yeah, so Pascal's going to go for the refurbish this, this turn. It and will get, not work. Get appetited. Who's hungry? Besides me and Luis, we're um, always hungry. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty hungry. You're hungry in too? Okay. All right. And there it is. Appetite for the natural. Last card out of hand for Seth. This is still Pascal Minard's main phase because you need to use that appetite before the beginning of combat. And even though Seth's drawing two cards a turn here <coughs> off Glensleeve Siphoner, look at Pascal's board. Like, how is Seth getting through it unless he draws almost exactly Walking Ballista? Right. And at some point, Pascal can just attack with all the creatures. Is that a search for Ascanta? Yep. Oh, okay. Mm, that could help him find stuff going forward. So Seth is going to cash in two energy for a card off of that Glint Sleeve Siphoner's ability. Seth doesn't really have a great attack here. Go. Sugar. And here's Search for Ascanta. Now we can just use that as a as a card value engine here. What? Yeah, you know, we, we saw him decline to transform the search earlier, but like you said, now he gets to just start <laughs> turning it through. Did he just find the Godfrey's <laughs> gift at the he top did. of his library? He did. Pascal Minard just cast it in his main phase. Remember, he has an angel of invention in the graveyard, and he has taken firm command of this game, perhaps with a big attack here lined up. He certainly can attack with these creatures in the air. What is it, 11, 10? Yeah. Seth doesn't really have like, like a yeah. single card that can just completely turn the game around here. So it's 10, ten in the air. 10 in the air. <clears throat> and then geez, Pascal's trying to figure out how much damage will it do. If Seth doesn't have a removal spell, then Seth is definitely dead. If Seth does, how bad is it for Pascal? Yeah, the card he has to be mindful of here is, of course, Braska's Contempt, which would also gain Seth Manfield two life. Attacking with all of those? Yeah. He's gonna attacking with all of those creatures. You can see four set aside. Block, 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 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. It's an exactly lethal attack, even with four blocks. And Seth Manfield sitting there staring at a forest in hand. And that's gonna be wow. it for game number four. And of course, gentlemen, we get a game number five here oh, in the finals. Why <laughs> well, uh, can laugh it off now. He won this game. Yes, so. yeah, didn't didn't sting, and you saw he said on purpose, but he put the old air quotes <laughs> on it there, just to uh, to make sure we knew he was kidding. But he did get away with it there. It didn't end up punishing him, and he has forced a fifth and deciding game here at Pro Tour Ixalan. Let's take a look at uh, some of the car the key cards here from our finals decks. This is Refurbish, and uh, this is a card that's kind of interesting. We've seen a few different ways to get God, God Pharaoh's gifts onto the battlefield. Some of the decks, um, you know, from a few months ago involved Refurbish, and then some didn't. Uh, now, they're all in on it. This, yeah. this is the way to get it back. So, so a lot of the decks used to play Gate to the Afterlife. Mm -hmm. um, instead of Refurbish, there was a lot of graveyard hit going around, but also just Refurbish. I think people have switched, shifted gears and changed to Refurbish because this does allow you to combo off a turn faster. Right, because mm. you can refurbish on turn four, and also by playing refurbish, you play fewer creatures, and you can play fewer creatures in your deck. Gate to the Afterlife requires six creatures in your graveyard before you can even activate it, whereas Pascal's deck only plays 16 creatures in his entire deck. And this is the card that allows you to just get those ridiculous starts where you can just take over the game starting from turn four. It's a much sleeker version of the combo, mm -hmm. and it's a little less sweet. <laughs> because Gate to the Afterlife <laughs> does some neat stuff, but this is just more efficient. Yeah, you know, one of the things about Gate to the Afterlife specifically is that it does cause such uh, restrictions during deck building. You need to have so many creatures where this deck, not at all. You know, they, they're playing a lot of different ways to get things in the graveyard, like chart, of course, and strategic planning, cards that you really don't have room for if you're trying to do the whole Gate to the Afterlife thing. Let's take a look at another card here. Our old friend, the Snake. Winding Constrictor still around in standard and still doing well now in the finals yet again. 
It's just the combination of an efficient two drop, two mana, two, three, you know, ha has an actual effect on the board and really does combine well, mostly with Long Tusk Cub, also with Walking Ballista, and still a combo with a like Glint Sleeve Siphoner, Rogue Refiner, and a Tomb of Ether. This card has had a rather incredible run through Standard since it was printed with entire decks built specifically around it. Sometimes it's a part of a puzzle like in this deck, but still it's a, it's a centerpiece for sure. Yeah, we saw Seth just completely dominate games where he just had a Whitey Constrictor and played with Long Tusk Cub. That combination is brutal. You can just you just have these these two drops. You you just have like three two drops on the battlefield, but your long his Long Tusk Cubs were like ten tens by like turn five. Yeah, it just can get completely insane. You absolutely have to deal with this card. It is weird when you read it. You just think, oh, that's that's probably pretty good. Well, that's a pretty cute card. Yeah. I'm sure some somebody's just gonna make do something cool with it. But you know what? It's probably pretty harmless. No, 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 no. It's not. It's explosive. It's weird because you know. Again, you just think like, okay, uh, an extra counter. That's, yeah, that's that's nice. But a plus one plus one counter. Yeah. And More it, energy. And on these cards that you know their activated abilities are doing it one per, where it's just stacking them up more and more and more, gets completely out of hand. Absolutely. Yeah, Whiny Constrictor, you're an all-timer, my friend. Players are finishing up this last sideboard session and our last game of the tournament. We're in Albuquerque, New Mexico, bringing you live coverage of Pro Tour Ixalan. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. I'm in the booth with Paul Chion and Luis Scott Vargas. We're having some fun here on a Sunday. Thanks so much for joining us, spending a little time watching everybody's favorite game. And uh, we're about to give away $50,000 to the winner. We don't know who it's going to be. It could be that man right there in his fourth Pro Tour Top 8, Seth Manfield. He's playing for Team Genesis. That's Pascal Maynard. This is his second Pro Tour Top 8. He was ruthlessly dispatched in his first one by you, Luis. That was modern, though. It was. He was playing Affinity, and I was playing the uh, soon-to-be-banned Eldrazi deck. Yes, you 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 were getting it <laughs> getting it good while you still could. Yeah, that was a pretty good deck. <laughs> in in so, retrospect, so, so good not that bad. I chose not to play it, even though I was part of the team. You, didn't you do pretty well though with that PT? I did. You, you I played did. Affinity, right? I did. I did. I, I top sixteen the tournament. Yeah, with you did really well. <laughs> but uh, but I just I wasn't comfortable because I actually didn't really test with it much. Because I tested um, like from home, I'm and then when I when I and I met up with them the day before, so I would have only had one day to actually test playing the Eldrazi deck. And turns out the deck was so good that you know I know I had a good finish, but I still probably should have played the Eldrazi deck. Still, that's a really good finish, <laughs> especially the considering tap you weren't. Eldrazi Temple to cast Thought Not Seer on turn two was like. <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel like, like that was, was good? I was capable of doing. <laughs> Did you feel very intelligent? I did. Yeah. Game five. Oh man, of course we're gonna get a game five. You think? Do you think Seth is gonna uh, do Pascal a solid this time and, and miss a land drop for, for Pascal? <laughs> just like, just you know, they were teammates, the fact right? That duress was was pretty good. <laughs> that duress was so good. It's like, whoa, wait, you didn't play a land. Yeah, and you know, Seth didn't say anything until uh, until Pascal brought it up, and then that was really really sank in for Pascal when he looked like, wait, 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 wait. oh no, I didn't play a land. Yeah. That look was was priceless. But, you know, we talked about the important part of a mistake like that, which is getting yourself together, because ultimately it didn't have a massive effect on the game as it stood. Pascal was able to still win, and he was able to still play spells in the following turns. You know, it could have punished him. I mean, I'm not going to lie. That could have gotten pretty bad, but he, he was fortunate to not have it be a disaster. And the, the real disaster would have been him letting it bother him so much that he played poorly and made more mistakes afterwards, which he, he did not do. And uh, I was happy to see him joke about it after as well, able to laugh. You know, we all, yeah. we all make mistakes. Well, it's easier to laugh about it when you win the game afterwards. I agree. Uh, I think we would have <laughs> <laughs> seen a different look. Seen something else, yeah, but, uh, but still. But still, um, being able to come back from, from something like that is, yeah, definitely big. It's also just a key part of getting to this level, to be honest, because, you know, if you let mistakes derail you every tournament, uh, it's usually only a matter of time until, you know, you forget something and uh, you got to be able to recover. Just another one of those skills that we learn in magic, but they translate over to real life as well.
There are many of those, including basic math, <laughs> among others. Who do you guys like here uh, for a winner? I feel like this matchup post board slightly favors Pascal, but I don't think it's by a lot. And Seth is on the play, mm -hmm. and Seth's best draws I think beat Pascal's uh, like medium draws. Like Seth's best draw actually probably beats Pascal's best draw if if Seth because Seth can have all the answers and have constrictor into into ballista or into cub and just get a really fast start. So yeah. slight advantage to Seth for you, Louise? No, I think Pascal has the, has a slight advantage. I just oh, think okay. it, I just think Seth is capable of winning this. I, I think like, I yeah, the top. The top, you know, 10% or 15% of Seth's draws, you know, will be able to pull, pull ahead. You know, some, he, we, we have yet to see a turn to a long tusk cub. Mm. He goes turn to a long tusk cub into the constrictor, into a ballista. That's going to be really hard for Pascal to come back from. If Seth also draws his handful of removal, he doesn't have a lot. But if he draws, you know, a hostage taker and a Vraska's Contempt, getting, you know, a timely, a timely one of those to get rid of one of those Fairgrounds Wardens to get his creatures back can swing things in a big way. We have seen a decent amount of mulligans here as well, so hopefully we'll get two powerful hands and uh, we'll let these two let their skills decide. No pressure, gentlemen. Just fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> as you mentioned, they are. Wait, good I thought they weren't friends, well. Luis. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> they violated <laughs> the team <laughs> ethics. There, <laughs> gave each other a high five. We do have, of course, the team series going. This is Team Genesis versus Team Mass Drop West. A great start to that for them with these two players making a deep run in the tournament. It does take that, and usually multiple of that over the course of a season. And we've got keeps from both players. This is going to be an attune with Ether here from Seth Manfield as we start game number five here from Pro Tour Ixalan. This is the decider. What does Pascal have to kick things off? pair of cast outs here. Okay. Well, one of those probably likely to get cycled. Nothing else going on early here for Maynard outside of Charter Course. Well, unfortunately, I think for Pascal, Seth's going to kick things off with a turn two Glint Sleeve Siphoner and has it the turn one attuned, so he's going to be able to start drawing extra cards right away, and that is exactly where Seth wants to be. Yeah, a bit of a slower start for Maynard, but of course he does have that turn two Charter Course, which can find him... Uh, you know, potentially a way to interact in turn three in the form of Fairgrounds Warden. Land go here from Maynard. The Glacial Fortress entering the battlefield tapped. He could have played an island, but that doesn't let him cycle anyway, so he may as well just play the tap land. So an even slower start than anticipated here for Pascal. And there's that Glint Sleeve Siphoner for Manfield with three energy at the ready. And no answers in sight yet for Pascal Maynard. He's going to have to settle for chart a course this turn to try to find some action. Yeah, turn one attuned with Ether. Look at that. It's it was one mana, search your library for a land and draw a card. He found refurbish, but he doesn't have anything else to go with it. He's just going to discard a land to the chart a course. And Seth Manfield, creeping ever closer to that trophy, he immediately cashes into energy and a life to gain in, to draw an extra card. He's going to get in for two damage minimum this turn. And what can he do to add to his board? He can play Rogue Refiner. Whoa. Death Court <laughs> Scavenger. Whoa. He has got a stacked hand. Oh, an Essence Scatter in hand as well for Seth. Yeah, Seth kind of has it all here. He's hitting his land drops as well. Maybe a Rogue Refiner turn here. He he does not have another land beyond the one that he just played. He would like to keep hitting them, but he's going to rely on these Glint Sleeve Siphoners to find him the lands. A perfectly reasonable plan here for Manfield. This also plays around Fairgrounds Warden by leaving Blossoming Defense up. Ooh, good draw there. Right off the top of the library for Pascal Maynard, he finds... And this is where he really Champion wants to hit God Pharaoh's Gift. Ooh, he hit his Fumigate, though. Hitting, wow. Hitting, hitting, hitting Fumigate could, could, could make this into a very interesting game. Oh, that is a one-of in his list, correct? Well, you, you, you play one to draw it, right? <laughs> 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 At the perfect time, game five, game five of the finals of the Pro Tour. He has one Fumigate in the sideboard. And he has yet to play it, right? That's right. The entire series. So this might potentially catch Seth off guard. Yeah, he is certainly aware of the uh, existence of it, but with one in the whole deck. 
So that might allow Pascal to come back because Seth is very, very far ahead in cards mm -hmm. due to those Glensleeve siphoners. Well, and that's the hard part from Pascal's perspective, right, is that Seth is at a point where he can pretty confidently just develop out his board, and if he does get fumigated, he'll still have four or five spells left, at, left over to uh, rebuild. Still, Fumigate could be an absolutely key part. If Pascal is to win this tournament, that could be a big an part of it. Six. And Seth drew a duress. He drew duress for the turn. Well, wow. there goes that plan right out the window. You saw him put his hand over the swamp. The only thing Seth's missing is it looks like Lance. Yeah, so that island is being very awkward for him. If he casts Duress this turn, he's going to have a somewhat inefficient turn, though he gets to leave up Essence Scatter. 14. On top of all this, he gets to attack with these two Siphoners. They both have Menace, so they're going to get in the red zone either way, knocking Pascal Maynard down to 14. I think I like just casting Rogue Refiner and just trying to hit your lever up. <laughs> How many cards does he have? And he has eight cards in hand, right? Sacred He's cat. actually going to play the Death Chord Scavenger and Maximum Aggression. He's going to exile the Sacred Cat. No okay. kitty cat for you. Nope. No blockers. Pascal Winar really needs to find something like a Fairgrounds Warden here. He found a land off the top. He does have two copies of Cast Out at his disposal. And because of Blossoming Defense, there's a good chance Pascal wants to just, well, cast it out right now because otherwise he, he does risk his four mana play getting blanked by a one mana spell. He does have that Fumigate in hand, so maybe he wants to just further develop his board, uh, so develop his hand by playing. I believe he has another Champion of Wits in hand, so he can play that. Maybe try to find a God Pharaoh's Gift to put into his graveyard. Although, uh, never mind, he discarded that refurbish. Okay. Yeah, he's off the God Pharaoh's Gift plan for now. So he's going to have to start going one for one on the removal, but we know that that's not a great game plan against this start from Manfield. The two copies of Glint Sleeve Siphoner have uh, fueled his hand. And while he has missed a little bit as far as mana goes, he'd love to hit some lands off of those. That means, of course, that the rest of his hand is just gasoline. And he's going to have to take down that scavenger. And since there's no blocks available anyway, Maynard's just going to go ahead and attack for two. I'll go to 17. Manfield back down to 17, using up two energy to draw a card. He just wants to see lands at this point. And he does. Fetid pools, even though it enters the battlefield tapped, still means that... He Seth gets to hit a land drop. And was it also Rish card that he drew? It was, though. That's a lot of mana, too. Cards in hand. Five. If he wants to take a turn to develop out his board, though, I think he just wants to smash here, doesn't he? He does, but what was the land that he drew? Was it a tap land? Yeah. Yeah, fitted okay. pools. So his mana is still a little bit constrained this turn. Mm -hmm. he, he, he has the ability to play Duress this turn, but he doesn't, can't really play anything after that. He can yeah. play Duress and keep up Essence Scatter. And that's especially good given okay. Pascal's got a bunch of angels on five mana. That's right. And yeah, this, this five mana slot is critical for both Fumigate and the, any type of angel effects that he has. So here's Jigs the up. information, duress. Oh. And this is going to be devastating for Pascal Minard because he had a lot of his game plan riding on this Fumigate. And Seth can simply take it away here with this key sideboard Sorry, card, duress. <laughs> Life total check from Seth Manfield. Life totals are critical at this juncture as Seth wants to now slam the door on Pascal as quickly as possible. We're assuming he takes the Fumigate here. I'd be highly surprised if he did not. Yes, that's what he took. Gets it, get in there, and he's just going to leave up Essence Scatter, I assume. He actually doesn't even have another play, but also leaving up Shatter sure. is just what he would want to do on this turn five anyway. This is uh, good protection from Pascal drawing something like an Angel of Invention off the top of his library. And this game is not over, but it is not great for, for Pascal, certainly. Is this a, a must counter here from Seth? Seth does have a ton of cards in hand, so yeah. I think he just wants to use anything he can because he doesn't want to discard, and he just wants to keep getting ahead in cards with those mm -hmm. Glintsleeve Siphoners. Yeah, Pascal did draw a one-drop that he can play here. It's not uh, Sacred Cat, unfortunately, but uh, it is Minister of Inquiries. That does let him threaten to block one of those mm -hmm. Menace Glintsleeve Siphoners. That's right. 
Seth again going to draw two cards this here, though. Four he's cards. Drawn, yes, he's drawn an extra card every turn now. He found Walking Ballista and a Whoa. land. Walking Ballista does let him break up the block party here from Pascal Maynard oh, and get in for an additional four. This turn of Winding Constrictor, Ballista for two, shoot the champion, attack for four, gain four energy thanks to the oh, Winding Constrictor. Even get to play a tap land this turn. That, that just sounds like that turn sounds like a dream come true. <laughs> yeah, that is fantastic. And remember, only one copy of Fumigate in the 75 for Pascal. So that is not a factor anymore for Seth Manfield. And yes, that turn doesn't let you leave up uh, Blossoming Defense, but you've seen Pascal's hand, and you know he drew Minister, so you know he doesn't have access to Fairgrounds Warden or Angel of Sanctions. He has a cast out, but you'll have a lot of threats in play. Right. If he wants to effectively use up all of his mana for cast out, I think you live with it. Yeah, Pascal is in a ton of trouble. He needs to draw multiple cards in a row, I think, to get back from this. Yeah, Seth Manfield is on the verge of becoming a Pro Tour champion. He was already world champion back in 2015. Going to get a couple of counters here. It looks like he's already planning on using one up on the champion of wits. That's exactly what he does. Gets in for four damage. Pascal Maynard falls down to six. Things it's are getting like very sketchy here, here for Pascal Maynard. Well, they have menace. Correct. That's six. Seth just reminding That's Pascal really that those uh, glint sleeve siphoners do four. in fact have menace, so blocking not an option in any capacity here for Pascal. Pascal does. Ha I don't know what what else is in his yard, but let's say he draws refurbish. Mm -hmm and uses the Minister of Inquiries and hits Angel of Invention and God Pharaoh's Gift, maybe that's the start for him to come back in this game, but it's super unlikely. Right, that is some risky business here. Especially given that Pascal's cited out some number of these cards, presumably. Pascal decides just to cycle cast out. He's digging for anything he can. <laughs> he found an opt. <laughs> Mac maximum cards. I mean, we get to see a lot of cards, but we get to keep digging here. We need refurbish plus God Pharaoh's gift in the graveyard. Also, I think and an angel, an angel of invention. <laughs> also, an angel of invention. <laughs> you know, Seth that, is that Seth is looking like he's going to be a Pro Tour champion and a World Champion. Not something you see every day, Seth Manfield. He always looks like he that. looks like he's almost smiling here. Well, <laughs> Seth, this is exactly the phase of the game I was talking about. Right. You, th you're, 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 you get to keep playing, but you know you're going to win. Right. Like, realistically, Seth knows he's going to win. He feels it. And he has to play these, game, these last couple turns out, make sure he doesn't screw up. But he, he is confident in his position. There's nothing Pascal can do that would take Seth from winning to just losing horribly. Pascal can maybe buy himself a turn here. But Seth feels good. He gets to play this game knowing that, that you know, victory is within his grasp. He just has to finish the job here. Pascal's going to start things off by casting Champion of Wits. He Found did Fairgrounds find Warden. a Fairgrounds okay. Warden. He has the land for it as well. What is he going to get rid of? You know, ideal target is generally walking Ballista, but maybe that's just it could be the too winding constrictor small here. here. Yeah. My suspicion is that it's the Winding Constrictor, but... I don't think that... Yeah, he I just doesn't have the luxury out. of taking the walking ballista and things looking fantastic for Seth Manfield now. Down this stretch in game number five, he has had to fight and scrap every minute of this tournament. another card here. But he's drawing two cards now, additional, and his draw step two. you got to feel like he can find the win here in the next turn or two. Seth so has to be able to put this together, right? Definitely. He's got a Rish card in hand. He can use the Rish card to put a counter on. Oh, he puts a counter on each of the Siphoners, attacks with both, one gets through, Blossoming Good Defense assist, it, right? Walking yeah. Ballista for the last point of damage. Yes, that is a winning line here for Manfield. Let's see if he finds it. He put one counter actually on the Ballista itself because he can use that to take out one of the blockers. So now Pascal has to... Oh, attack. And this lets him uh, just attack with all three <laughs> creatures. Like double checking the hand just to make sure. Yep. Do I have this? This also does the trick. Yeah. This is also a winning line. Pascal Maynard has no blocks that keep him alive. And that, of course, is thanks to blossoming defense in hand for Seth Manfield. Pascal Maynard is completely tapped out. And now Seth knows for sure that he's about to win. There it is. Tour Ixalan. The blossoming. blocks have been set. Yeah, blossoming defense right for the win. 
Seth Manfield double checks the life total <laughs> one last <laughs> time here at Pro Tour Ixalan. He's ordering the blockers. <laughs> yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. Well, yeah. Fire it off, Seth. Show us that blossoming defense. Wait, you're tapped out. Okay, just making sure. Two, three, four, five, six. The excitement perhaps getting to Seth a little bit here. There's blossoming defense. And that's going to do up. it. He's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's slow rolling his friend. I think that's pretty much what he's doing. Just gets up to give him a big hug. And we have our champion. It's Seth Manfield. He is a world champion in 2015. He's a pro tour champion here in Albuquerque. And you can see he can hardly believe it. Hands on his face. And look at this. His team coming out <laughs> to lift him in the air. That's or just Team Chris Genesis. Larson. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and when you have Chris Larson on your team, you don't have to do any lifting outside of that. He does all the lifting for you. And you can see the rest of Team Genesis also congratulating and even offering condolences to Pascal Maynard on an epic finish here as well. He's going to have to settle for second place, but still further than he's ever gotten, and this close, one game away for Pascal Maynard from winning the Pro Tour. But Seth Manfield is our champion. That was a great way to end our tournament, gentlemen. Fantastic stuff from both of you. Thank you so much for walking us through some complex situations there. And uh, that is going to do it for this one. It sounds like we've got news and updates from the news desk. So send it over there. Thanks very much to Marshall and Paul and Louis Scott Vargas, of course, an outstanding trio. I've been joined by Maria Bartholdi, of course, and Simon Gertzen, a Pro Tour champion. Simon, it's a few years ago now, but what is that moment like when you're sitting there, it's the last turn of the match, and you know that nothing stands between you and the title Pro Tour champion? You, you could see that Seth, even though he has been in these super high pressure situations, he almost couldn't believe it. He couldn't realize that it was just happening, that that blossoming defense was just securing him the title of Pro Tour Champion. What was, uh, in your opinion, kind of the keys overall to that matchup that led Seth to the victory? I think it's just putting on pressure and always making sure that Pascal cannot execute his game plan uh, easily. You always have to say, look, you get something, but I'm attacking you, I'm generating energy, I'm drawing extra cards. I will not allow you to just do what you want to do. Well, we talked about it before the final began. We said that Pascal was trying to be alive early and Seth was trying to win early. And we saw repeatedly Pascal under pressure going, well, I have to do this and now my only choice is that to stay in it. Oh, but you have an answer. Um, and so it, it was classic in that way. So, why don't we take a look at our bracket and show you what's been happening here on our first Pro Tour Sunday of the 2017 to 18 season. Uh, and of course, as we always do, we came in with eight players, four from the United States, Mike Sigrist, Sam Eilenfeld, Seth Banfield, and John Rolfe. Then from Europe, you had Guillaume Matignon of France, Piotr Glagowski of Poland, and Christian Hauk of Germany. And then we rounded out our top eight, still in North America, with Pascal Maynard. Uh, Simon, across the quarterfinals, um, I guess the, the, the tightest and the most interesting turned out to be Mike Sigrist against uh, Sam uh, Eilenfeld. Yes, it did. This, this matchup seemed super close. It, it seemed like either player could win, and there were a lot of tricky decisions to make. So both of these players had to navigate really complex turns, racing situations. Do I chomp block with my Thopters early on to preserve life total, or is there a way to race back? Uh, I thought it was a really interesting matchup regarding uh, this, these combat math situations and when to race, who's, who's the beatdown, basically. Was it a very mathematical top eight? Sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it, it's about one player trying to do a thing, the other one actively stopping them. It felt like there was a lot of counting going on, a lot of you're at six and I'm at 13, but if you have this, it'll be eight to 12, which means I'm no longer racing you. Was it a math? Top eight? I, I wouldn't call it a math top eight, but it was a more tactical top eight than a strategical right. one. Oh. Because strategically speaking, these matchups are, well, a lot of them are in the 45 to 55 percent range. Even though we are saying Teamer Energy is the best deck of the format, we see that how close these edges are. So a lot of it comes down to technical, tight, crisp play, and of course, counting and predicting 
the future, the future turns is a, a key element of that. And you know, Seth Manfield has just, I mean, he's just one of the greatest players in the game right now. This is fourth Pro Tour top eight, of course, a world champion, and now a Pro Tour champion. And a question I usually like to ask players is, why are you good at this game? Like, what do you have that you think makes you a really great Magic player? Do you have any insight as to why Seth continues to put up results like this? Well, I have to, I have to say, I have to say that much. I was, I was not following uh, exactly how the standings shaped up, and then when there was the announcement and Seth walks up the stage, I was like, oh, of course, he's also in the tournament, right? He made the top eight, of course. Seth is really amazing to me because he makes very complex magic look easy. You don't see the amount of energy he spends. Not like other players who are also very good, but you kind of see the sweat. Uh, trickling down the, their face. And, and Seth, I think, has just a very good intuitive grasp of what goes on in a, in a game of Magic, especially when it comes to these mid-range strategies. Something that is super interesting to me because this has been an unusual Pro Tour in terms of the date. This is not a couple of weeks after the pre-release. Everyone had the chance to do 50, 75, 100 Ixalan drafts if they wanted to. Everyone knew the standard format coming in. And not just Seth, but the rest of that Genesis team are profoundly talented at going, in week six, this is the right deck. And I almost guarantee you that if Seth Manfield comes along to Grand Prix Atlanta in six days' time, will he be playing the same deck? I sincerely doubt it. And if he is, you can bet it will be very different in its approach because he only builds decks for now, for today. Tomorrow takes care of itself. And that constant reinvention is a huge deal for that team on Genesis, that they were perfectly positioned for a format that was this mature. I, I have been stressing the point that it's important that we test different skill sets at different points in time. And this Pro Tour tested different skill sets than a Pro Tour which is two weeks after the release. And that's, in my opinion, a very good thing because every player has certain skills, skills strengths and weaknesses. And I don't think it's a surprise that we see a member of Team Genesis win this Pro Tour. Brett Nelson, for me, was one of the um, picks to really benefit from a more evolved, more defined metagame. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of other players, but Brett Nelson kind of encapsulates all of this. Always one week ahead, uh, very good lists. When he came to us here in, in the interview and said, Seth, uh, Seth Manfield is going to win this Pro Tour, <laughs> I, I didn't have much doubt because he really knows what he's talking about. And they spent an hour arguing about sideboard decisions too, which is <laughs> pretty telling. Yeah, get that rogue refiner out of there. That's <laughs> the that's the story from Brad. Well, it is time to hand out some hardware and some cold hard cash. It's time for the award ceremony here at Pro Tour Ixalan. Welcome to the feature match area here in Albuquerque, New Mexico for Pro Tour Ixalan. It is time for the best part of Pro Tour Weekend. It's time to honor our champion from the United States of America, Seth Manfield. Seth, wow, those were five intense games against Pascal down the stretch. Now, you've been the world champion, you've been a GP champion, now you're a Pro Tour champion. How does it compare? Oh, this is crazy. I mean, the Pro Tour, it's been around for so many years. To be a part of this, to put my name in history, it's just amazing. I mean, this has been something I've been dreaming about, you know, ever since I started playing Magic, you know, 17 years ago. You know, I've been working and working and working and, you know, to all of that culminated here today, and it's just crazy right now, honestly. <laughs> what about in that game five? You had the win on the board, you were working it out, Pascal just took off his headset and came and gave you a hug. Did he startle you there? Yeah, he, he came at me and I was like, oh my gosh, like, I, I had the win, I was just, I don't even know what I was thinking, I was just taking in the moment. And um, I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, I, I hadn't played this matchup at all. Didn't even have time to figure out sideboarding. So it was kind of just winging it. It was a crazy match. Pascal played very well and um, happy to take it down, obviously. 
Now, this is the first pro tour of the season, which means that the team competition is in full swing. You just put Team Genesis number one on the leaderboard by a single point. Great work. Is there anybody you want to thank or recognize from your team? Oh, yeah. Well, obviously, my whole team, uh, Brad Nelson, Corey Baumester, BBD, Martin Mueller, and Lucas Blahon. I hope I got everyone. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> Team Revelation, they test with us also. They're amazing test partners. I couldn't do it without them. They handed me this salt eye deck. So, I, I mean, it, it was great. We only had three decks to choose from on Thursday, so that's that's a low number for Seth. So it was good. <laughs> Seth, congratulations once again. You're our champion for, for Pro Tour Ixalan. Hell yeah!